The Romans were proud to be people of action. Fighters, builders, occasional backstabbers, and generally the kind of guys whose only abstract thought happened against their will after spending too much time with the Greeks and getting a contemplative contact high. That's an exaggeration, but only by a little. The Romans loved to talk, but that was largely confined to the art of rhetoric and oratory. It took them centuries before they seriously devoted their literary efforts beyond the lofty political speeches characteristic of their republic. But in time, and after much schmoozing with those particularly pensive Greeks, the Romans got a few wise guys of their own. Similar to the Greeks, Roman philosophy is just as much a study of wacky characters and their esoteric ideas, but the cultural backdrop of the Roman world took their thinking in new and very different directions from old standbys like Plato and Aristotle. So, to learn about some of these Roman smart boys and see what they were on about, Faciamus Historiam. We begin this story as Rome often does fashionably late. In this case, by the time Rome conquered all of Italy and started being sociable with the wider Mediterranean world in the 200s BC, the golden age of Greek philosophy was already a century old. They were so late for Plato's lecture, he died before they even showed up. Gosh, kids these days, no discipline. Now, after Plato and Aristotle founded their schools back in the 300s, Athens snowballed into the place for philosophy. But as wise men and eager students poured in from all across Greece, the wider world was changing. Alexander, the student of Aristotle, stretched the definition of Greece to include the entire Eastern Mediterranean, and the next 300 years saw Rome steadily conquer that Hellenistic world province by province. By the time Rome's cartographers ran out of red paint, our end result was a Roman culture inheriting a rich philosophical tradition, but one that took them a while to figure out. Now, Roman scholars could engage with Greek philosophy in its original language, as the educated elite was comfortably bilingual in Greek and Latin, but there was a sense that in order to create a Roman philosophy, the first task was getting everything into Latin. And this brings us to Rome's foundational wise guy, Marcus Tullius Cicero. An orator, statesman, and writer so absurdly prolific he's become every Latin student's sleep paralysis demon, Cicero traveled across Greece to study philosophy from the best the first century BC had to offer, and made it his pet project to collect the sum of all that wisdom in Latin. He he says outright in his De Finibus Bonorum et Malorum that teaching philosophy in Latin makes it a Roman citizen. In the span of just a year and a half, he wrote over a dozen works discussing and contrasting the popular philosophical schools of the day. Stoicism, Epicureanism, and others like Skepticism and Platonism. And while I hate to further inflate the ego of Rome's most conceited blowhard, I have to give the man credit for writing most of these as dialogues in the style of Plato. The dialogue format is the best way to showcase philosophical ideas, and windbag he may be, Cicero nailed the assignment. This also makes sense given his lengthy career in Roman law and politics. He knows how to argue a case and addresses competing philosophies through that lens of rhetoric. So, late to the party, as Cicero and the Romans may have been, they gave philosophy a new life through a new language. And here in Latin, two schools dominated Roman thought. Stoicism and Epicureanism. Both were created by Greeks who came to Athens and began teaching around 300 BC. Both grew in popularity during the Hellenistic era, and centuries later, both would find enthusiastic devotees in Rome. Now, where to start? Hmm, eeny, meeny, miny, Epicurus. E-Man claimed that the essence of a happy life was pleasure, which, on the face of it, sounds like an appeal to raw hedonism. Live fast, die young, and rack up noise complaints from your neighbors as you ruin the lives of everyone around you. Athens' favorite madman Diogenes would certainly be proud, but the Epicurean goal is a bit more refined. The aim is really to avoid pains, reject evil or self-destructive desires, and enjoy the simple, virtuous pleasures that make people happy. Good friends, good food, a stroll through a garden, the stuff you'd put on an ancient lifestyle blog. The philosophy at play here is the idea that there are pleasures for the body and the mind, and while both are worth pursuing, physical joys like the taste of a meal will pass immediately, yet the power of friendship is a lifelong delight. The Epicurean quest to avoid bad vibes sought two things. Aponia, the absence of physical pain, and ataraxia, a state of serene calmness without the disturbance of fear. On that line, Epicureans believe that there's no reason to worry about any troublesome divine intervention because the gods were perfect beings who didn't pay attention to human affairs. This put the Epicureans in an awkward position amid a society constantly engaged in divine supplication, and it wasn't the only belief of theirs to catch flack. Other philosophers compared their want of pleasure to the animalistic impulses of a pig. Yet, thoroughly unbothered, the Epicureans reclaimed the pig metaphor. The Augustan era poet Horace described himself as a swine from the herd of Epicurus, and the imperial era biographer Plutarch wrote an entire dialogue where Odysseus debates his fellow sailor Grelus after he'd been transformed by Circe into a pig. Grelus manages to convince Odysseus that as an animal, he is categorically immune to unnatural desires for evil because it can't even conceive of them, and thus is happier and more virtuous than Odysseus. Literally, pigs are happier than humans because they haven't yet invented crime. While Epicurus was a prolific writer, the vast majority of his works have been 
lost, so our best source for the philosophy is the 1st century BC poet Lucretius, whose De Rerum Natura, or On the Nature of Things, details Epicurean philosophy with over 7,000 lines of Latin meter. We've got basically nothing on the man's life, so we can only hope he enjoyed himself, but his work was renowned across Rome for its philosophical heft as well as its raw artistry, and in later centuries was quoted widely by Epicureans and non-Epicureans alike. Speaking of, that'll take us to the other school Rome embraced. Stoicism. Born at the same time as Epicureanism, this philosophy gets its name from the Stoa Picili in Athens, the public hall where Zeno of Kition likes to teach. His philosophy was an evolution of Socratic thought where the most important thing is internal virtue. That sounds a little stuffy and frankly not as fun as what the Epicureans were doing, but at its core, Stoicism is also a philosophy of how to live. Rather than minimize pain to cultivate happiness, Stoics disregarded all outside forces, negative and positive. The idea is that the only thing we can truly control is ourselves. Our wisdom, courage, and temperance make us virtuous, and virtue is a reward that no misfortune can take away. That said, this is not a philosophy where nothing matters. Distinguishing itself from the cynics like Diogenes the pathological asshole, Stoicism was still a very social philosophy concerned with the virtue of the wider community beyond just the self. The fourth Stoic virtue is justice, and many Stoics took an active role in public life to drive society toward collective virtue. Taken together, this philosophy had obvious interest for the Greeks and their highbrow conception about the nature of justice, but it also had a clear appeal to the Romans and their deeply practical interest in law. In the 100s BC, Panaetius of Rhodes made his way to Rome and founded a school to introduce the locals to Stoicism. By the time Cicero shows up a century later, you couldn't swing a gladius in the Senate without hitting a Stoic. But for all its noble ideology, there was also a deeply rational appeal of Stoicism. In the first century BC, the Roman Republic was struggling, so the inner serenity of Stoicism was a coping method. And this got even worse during the Empire, because some of those guys were nuts. The senator and Stoic philosopher Seneca weaseled out of a death sentence from Caligula, was exiled by Emperor Claudius and allowed back a decade later, only then to become a tutor for Emperor Nero. That's a high-pressure job with a steep penalty for perceived failure, but Seneca kept Nero in shape for a few years. His influence had clearly slipped by 59 AD when Nero dabbled in casual matricide, so Seneca withdrew from public life in the years after to go write philosophy. The Stoic mindset surely helped him keep sane amid the increasingly tyrannical hijinks of his boss, but when Nero sentenced him to death for alleged involvement in a conspiracy, Seneca demonstrated stoic tranquility amid the worst employee performance review in Roman history. But the stress of Roman monarchs went both ways, as perhaps Rome's most famous philosopher of all was Emperor Marcus Aurelius, the stoic who was regarded in his lifetime as the platonic ideal of a philosopher king, but who seems to have wanted more than anything else in the world to not have the responsibilities of an entire empire bearing down on him all the time. That stress would have been especially pronounced as he spent a decade on campaign along Rome's northern frontier, and Marcus kept a diary in Greek full of Stoic reassurances that he would not lose his freaking mind so long as he kept up his philosophical discipline. We know this diary as The Meditations, and it's not the most literarily rigorous philosophy book from the Roman world, Lucretius fans stay winning, but very obviously the thoughts of a deeply human writer from himself to himself. The meditations present the essence of Stoicism from quite possibly the most interesting perspective. It's the man who has everything grappling with the existential difficulty of being a person. Even the Emperor of Rome recognizes that he's powerless without control of his thoughts and emotions. And this brings us towards some ideas that would outlast Roman Stoicism. Because like the other Stoics, Marcus sought to live in harmony with a divine reason governing the universe called Logos. And the power of philosophy is to understand one's place in a whole far bigger than the themselves. Whether the outside world is easygoing or unbearably hard, there's that internal refuge, a mental fortress where the philosopher can feel at ease. Between this and the divine logos, not even death is a threat. Marcus Aurelius ends the meditation saying, serenely take your leave, serene as he who dismisses you. And by this point, feels fair to say that Stoicism has stepped past pure philosophy and taken on the air of religion. That's not an accident. So far, we've seen how Roman philosophy evolved out of Greek philosophy, but here's the twist. Its endpoint is Christian philosophy. The divine inner calm, strength in the face of persecution or misfortune, the ascetic rejection of worldly pleasures in pursuit of higher virtues, these are true for Stoicism and Christianity alike. Logos is the guiding force for Marcus Aurelius and the original source of divinity in the Gospel of John. That said, they are absolutely not one-to-one, -one, as Christians believed in an afterlife while Stoics emphatically did not, and Christians dismissed Stoicism as too pagan to be useful, but it's clear that the faith that'll one day be the religion of Rome drew
through on other Roman ideas as it took shape. This also applies to Neoplatonism, an updated form of Plato's philosophy that placed extra emphasis on the One as a divine force from which all goodness, thought, and physical reality derive. Kinda feel like I've heard that one before. <laughs> By the time thinkers like St. Augustine got writing in the 400s, Christianity had been irreversibly shaped by its fellow Roman philosophies. It would become the grandest and most consequential of them all, but it was still deeply indebted to its Roman forebears, above all, Stoicism. So, with origins off in Greek philosophy and a legacy in the biggest religion on Earth, what's Roman about Roman philosophy? Well, put it this way. Greeks could spend dialogue after dialogue trading theories on the nature of justice, but the Romans would rather write a dang law code and quit burning daylight. Philosophy wasn't a la dee da thought exercise over wine, it was a tool, most relevant to the Romans when it was useful to them. Theoretical models of the universe are a lot less practical than concrete models for behavior. They skipped past if and why to get to what and how. Marcus Aurelius wrote my conclusion for me. Put an end to this discussion of what a good man should be, and be one. You go, Marcus. Sorry your life was a pain in the ass. <laughs> Oh, woe be him, Emperor of Rome, having responsibilities. What a pain in the butt job it is when you actually try. In any case, thank you for watching. The eternal struggle with understanding Roman thought is figuring out where the ideas they copied end and their own ideas begin, but it's a rewarding challenge to tackle. I'll see you in the next video.